Milton Kettler stepped forward to the pedestal provided for speakers, casually dressed in soft gray slacks, an open shirt, and a pale blue blazer. Displaying his infectious smile, he began, Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. We just want you to know some of the people who have been with us for so long and who are looking forward to developing Montgomery Village with us. I would like to introduce you to my eldest brother, Charles, who operates the commercial construction end of our business, my younger brother, Clarence, who is responsible for design and construction, and our brother-in-law, Bill Farlines, who serves as president and financial officer of the company. We are Kettler Brothers. Perhaps the most poignant comment of all was made by Irving Fox. Did you hear what those big city boys said? 35,000 people at Gaithersburg. William Hurley Jr., Montgomery Village, a new town. While the highways had brought urbanization further and further out from the car of Washington, D.C., much of the land was still being used for traditional agriculture. One of these pieces of farmland was the 412-acre Walker Farm, which was 20 miles northwest of Washington. Washington, D.C., and right outside the town of Gaithersburg, Maryland. It was originally purchased by Nathan J. Walker in 1849 and had been passed down through the generations. However, the Walkers had gone beyond cultivating crops on the large estate. James F. Walker Jr., great grandson of Nathan, worked with a group of real estate developers called the Kettler Brothers, which had built anything and everything from churches to houses to gas stations. And now, planned suburban communities. Plus, his sister, Barbara, was married to Milton Kettler. At a party between the two families, the idea of a new town riding on the success of the Kettler's old farm development bubbled up. The Walkers and Kettlers came to the conclusion that a sale of the land would be profitable and a promising idea, and a contract was struck up in 1962. The Kettlers continued to buy up about 20 other properties in the area until ground was broken for the village on February 28, 1966. To mature the barren farmland, 10,000 pin oak trees were imported from Laurel, Maryland to be planted around using state-of-the-art equipment. Along with that, running through the Walker property was a small stream, the Whetstone Run. The Kettlers dammed it and various tributaries in several different places to build lakes, including in the southeastern edge of the village. Construction started on that lake in the spring of 1966, and it was named Lake Walker and overlooked a free 55 to Washington, the main access point to the development. In the main area of the village, a small indoor shopping mall was built, called the Village Mall. However, the Kettlers had bigger plans. While it was serviceable for the budding community in the late 1960s, the Briars wanted to build a proper indoor mall by the lake and the forest. As early as 1969, the Kettlers began negotiations with the city of Gaithersburg and local landowners to expand to 355 and build connecting roads through the 130 acres of land known as South Lake. After that was confirmed, the Kettlers wasted no time again approaching the city and county governments of the construction of a, quote, regional shopping center, which the city of Gaithersburg gave the go-to in January of 1971. However, the brothers soon realized they would need some help. Where the highways went, A. Alfred Tubman followed. Michigan-based college dropout started his business off in 1950 at the age of 26 when he borrowed $5,000, started his own development firm, and in three years had built a 26-star open-air shopping center in Flint, Michigan. The business then rapidly expanded after opening up his first indoor mall, the Southland Mall in Hayward, California, in 1964. He continued his business, going all around the country with his malts, always near interstate highways in the suburbs, which were wildly successful. By 1978, Tubman had built 65 million square feet of shopping centers and owned and operated 17 major regional centers. He was an aggressive salesman with an effective brain trust running his marketing team, which led him to become king of the retail mall. In late 1971, the Kettlers approached the Tubman Company with the idea of the shopping center, then dubbed Southlake Mall. The events from there moved quickly. 
After two meetings in January of the following year, a Memorandum of General Agreement was signed on February 17, 1972. The land sold to Tubman for five and a quarter million dollars, 32 million dollars when adjusted for inflation. Tubman then opened a new regional headquarters in Washington, D.C. and demolished the lake and forest to the ire of local citizens. However, it was no use. The Tubman machine started construction of the now-named Lake Forest Mall, giving credence to the land they destroyed, in October 1976. Opening day for the Lake Forest Mall was September 8, 1978, and it was in style. At time of opening, it was the largest retail center in the state of Maryland. Within its 1.3 million square feet it hosted, a then uncommon central heating and cooling system, a green room, a water-surrounded amphitheater, glass elevator, skylights, an Olympic-sized skating rink, several movie theaters, gardens, fiberglass statues, and four anchor stores, Sears, J.C. Penney's, Woody's, and Hex. However, to many, Tubman's multi-million dollar investment seemed to be irresponsible. The country found itself recovering from a recession by the start of construction. This economic wariness was obvious, for on opening day, only a fourth of the stores were leased due to the skepticism and a high leasing price. However, to Tubman and a new administrative crew, it didn't matter, with the manager Robert Phelps stating that, if we ever leased a mall in advance, Mr. Tubman would figure we built it only half big enough. Normally, it takes us about two years to fill up. Some people have told us that square foot lease price is quite high. We're willing to wait to get the exact store we want. These store events are working well at Lake Forest. We definitely see doing more in store activities in the future because the merchants like them and because they work. Five days until Christmas, and shoppers at the Lake Forest Mall are staying vigilant. On Thursday afternoon, a 63-year-old woman exited the shopping center near Macy's. While walking to her car, an unknown man pulled out a knife and demanded money. When the woman fought back, the man stabbed her multiple times. He then ran away. Four Hispanic men holding knives, chasing the two victims through the mall parking lot. You can see a suspect in a gray sweatshirt swing a large knife and stab one of the victims. Well, certainly this has been very difficult and I think has only worsened his health. But, uh, but again, I think we've got, some, we've got some work to do over the next 10 days. Eight million dollars. Eight million dollars. Hello, and welcome everyone to Lake Forest Mall. Now, the, uh, the interesting thing about this mall is how polygonal everything is. Very tight curves and edges. And so, you can see here with the lights and how they're in diamond shape and how you can see later on, especially as we go towards that uh, main area, how there's always um, ways to view down into the first floor of the mall, since right now we're on to second. And um, they're all in little tri little um like diamond shapes and and so it's a really interesting pattern you're also going to see with the skylights soon just how rigid everything is and modern modernist it uh it looks and uh here we got both uh, the old jc pennies which uh closed a month a couple months earlier and um the top part of one of the couple of st uh statues in the mall and it's hard Hard to capture them on camera, but, you know, Tubman was always a fan of making his malls look luxurious. So he always, um, so he imp imported a bunch of this stuff. I'm pretty sure fiberglass, they're fiberglass from Italy. And so, to make it look nice. You can start to see the pattern of how around all of these closed anchor stores, the, uh, the stores flanking it are also closed. And the thing is, a lot of these stars actually came in when 
when the leasing prices rent went down and so and so the fancier stores left, these cheaper stores came in since leasing prices are as low as one dollar per uh, square foot. Um but even then even that's sometimes too high due to the lack of profits so they're leaving. Now what's interesting is that a lot of these old star spaces they're up there's advertisements for the uh, other still open stores in the mall, but the only one really that they're advertising is Rita's. Not even the other clothing stores, just Rita's. And um, here we see the uh, the Macy's in the mall, which is the last remaining anchor store still open. It wasn't even there at construction. It replaced a hex. You see how, like, these are actually really nice storefronts, wooden glass, but how just the business has moved out and no no one want, wants to take them up again. Here you just got a view of the Sears, which had only closed a week before I came into the mall to record. And they were still moving stuff out of it. I had three separate recording sessions. First one was their final sale. Second one was um there's a bunch of trucks outside are moving stuff out of the sears and the third one is this one where it's mostly empty and the trucks weren't in the driveway anymore and you're gonna see soon how just this is clearly like the emptiest part of the mall all the neighboring stores have closed originally the mall was co-owned by the tubman centers and general motors asset management until 2004, when uh, Tubman pa the Tubman Centers pawned off several of their malls, which included Lake Forest Mall to the Milt Center, who uh, continued the 50-50 agreement with um, General Motors in 2004. However, um, three years later, in 2007, the Simon Property Group um, bought the uh, bought the Mills Corporation and ended up owning about 25% of the mall. Simon took a 141 million dollar loan on the mall and defaulted on it, and so after that it was sold for to five mall capital partners for 100 million dollars in 2012. Urban Retail Properties was given management of the mall with 20 million dollars invested to actually reshaping the decaying the now decaying building. And the only thing that came of that was the center found and being destroyed. And, um, you know, under five mile, you know, it just, the mall, mall really started declining. The operating income for 2012 was 14.68 million. In 2016, it was 6.18 million. Occupancy went down from 96% to 84%. The mall mortgage, um, that five mile had uh, was defaulted in January 2017 with 80 million dollars left unpaid. So the bank, U.S. Bank, bought it for 19.1 million dollars. For reference, when the Kettler sold the land to Tubman, the farm la the land it sat on itself was worth 30 million dollars when adjusted for inflation. So the bank ended up selling it to WRS Inc. of Mount Pleasant. South Carolina for $24.8 million earlier this year. And um, they've brought in new developers, Brad Klein of Klein Associates and Annapolis management firm Petrie Richardson Ventures to help review them all and rebuild it. And hopefully something will come out of that. It's just the thing that's prevented any of the previous owners from doing anything is agreement that goes back to when Tubman bought the land from the Kettlers, in which each anchor store owns their section of mall. And so any anything that wants to be done needs all of their approval. But now with all the anchor stores closed but one, hopefully something can change. Speaking of anchors, right here we have um, the old Lauren Taylors, which used to be a Woody's, a Woodward and Lofrops. And in its day, it was a regional retail giant in the DC area. And it was the first small to actually sign on to being an anchor, and the first company to sign up to be an anchor on, in the mall in, uh, in the 1972-1973 agreement. In 1984, the chain was actually bought by Tubman, but many attribute him for the downfall for not understanding what actually made 
the uh, chain profitable. In 95, the company went defunct and um, it was converted to Lord and Taylor's in the early 2000s. Here, we're taking the escalator down to the actual center of the mall where the old fountain used to be. And on the right, there's the charging station, which I'm pretty sure used to be a guest services um, place. However, I'm pretty sure with the cutbacks to the mall, it was just changed the charging station. And actually, when me and my friend were sitting there, many times people would walk up to us, old ladies would walk up to us and ask us where things were. And, you know, it would be like, oh, that closed, that closed, that closed. And, you know, the looks on your face is really described at all. And here's uh, something interesting. While I didn't go um, past the actual stars down there, those stars over there go very deep in. They, they're very except wider than the rest of the stars in this building. And the reason because is because in the original floor plans, that was supposed to be a movie theater. Um, so yeah, and so then, um, I don't know if that actually ended up getting built. However, that was in the original floor, floor plans in uh, 78. Here we got the timeout zone. There was a second one on the, on the second floor, and as you can see, completely empty. These wooden doors here used to be the entrance to the uh, silver diner that we had. We're gonna get a quick view of what it looks like out here see half of these doors are actually uh, broken. I've gone around to repairing them. I remember going there multiple times with my uh, uncle and my dad. They sold good uh, chocolate chip pancakes. And here we have the beginnings of the food court. So, um, originally it was an ice rink when the mall was built until 1984 when it then became a uh, theater. The theater went out of business in uh, 2000 and it got replaced with the uh, five million dollar food cart which stands today as by far the busiest part of the mall. And as we're gonna get to see soon, it's not even that busy like that. Um, the chicken, uh, chicken shop right here used to be a McDonald's, but the McDonald's left. So that shows, you know, the dire straits we're in. See, not that many people. A. Alfred Tubman was a gambling man. He took very large risks and most paid off. However, towards the end of his career, they came back to bite him. These malls are a legacy of him and his heirs' wealth, ambitions, and decadence, which have all faded with time. His final legacy still remains, though, for these places aren't just malls, but deep-rooted memories for many. In 1990, Steve Cole wrote for the Washington Post, Talking about his childhood in the area in the, uh, the 1970s. Memory usually arises from something fixed, something tangible, but Montgomery County is possessed by an inferior transience. Even, even then, it was clear that growth came at the expense of a sense of place. We would return from summer camp and have to learn to street map all over again. The scale of industrial accomplishment was dazzling in its way, but also produced anxiety. A fear that if you overslept, you might wake up at a different address. It's difficult to recall what existed when, or how it changed, or why, because Montgomery is in a state of continuous, rapid flux. And so, the rapid march of progress has continued since the days of the highways and the Kettlers. In Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, the writer, visiting the old crumbling hotel the plot is set in some decades earlier, ends the movie with the lines. It was an enchanting old ruin. But I never managed to see it again. 
have a good night, everybody.